back in seat. That's very kind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to thank all three of you for your, your championship of this bill and for bringing it to us. It's a very important subject. Uh, and I think, uh, Senator Carignan, you said it very well when you said that uh, the, the profession of journalism is really a pillar of our democracy. It's an institution that very much falls into the, the fabric of Canada's democracy. Um, and yet, um, there are challenges. It's a complex subject. It's as much about uh, the bill that's before us today, but it's also about the financial aspects of the profession the financial challenges, the structural changes in the employment relationship that journalists face today. It's the changing media environment that really is transforming with so much information now making its way through social media to us. And I think I want to put to you also thirdly um, that uh, there is a prospect of people using the vehicle of journalism to do us harm. I also sit on the defense committee in addition to this one. And uh, you know the, the whole paradigm of fake news um, and uh, an intentional misleading through journalistic channels is something that we need to take very seriously. I wanted to echo my colleague uh, Pam Demoff's concerns that we, we do not have um, representatives from the police forces in front of us this afternoon, even though we have a written brief. Um, but the subject matter is complex, and I think the committee, in addition to having the aspiration of being expedient on this bill, also needs to be mindful of the various facets and aspects of this, um, of this important piece of legislation. And I'm wondering if I could ask you, uh, perhaps Senator Pratt, if you could paint for the committee and also for Canadians your snapshot of the state of the profession uh, as it exists in 2017 and how you see it evolve in, let's say, maybe a short-term horizon of the next five years. Um, what is journalism all about these days? And, and what does the committee need to be mindful of when we tackle a bill uh, such as this one, even though this might only be a first step, as my colleague just pointed out? In 30 seconds, yes. You have well, it's, minutes. It's a difficult situation because there's not an obvious business model uh, for, uh, for journalism. So uh, it's, it is very difficult. But at the same time, I think if you look at it from, a, if you find, if you look for a positive side, I think there is a positive side because the, there is demand for quality news. If you look at what's going on in the, in the U.S. today, uh, it is obvious that people are yearning for quality news. There is a lot of fake news, but people want quality news. So it's a, it's a matter of finding the right business model. And you can see that in the U.S., quality newspapers right now are doing quite well. The New York Times, the, the, New York Times, the Washington Post are finding ways of uh, uh, getting back to in the black. So that's good news. But it, they, they, those are exceptions right now, and it's a matter of finding, you know, how to get advertising back to uh, traditional newspapers or news organizations, and that's very difficult. I've, I've worked for 30 years for La Presse, which is now one of the more uh, innovative uh, news platforms in the world, really, and they're in difficulty, so it's difficult. I, I might, if I might add a word about police forces, in the Senate committee where we studied S-231, we tested that definition, uh, that definition of journalists with them, and they said they agreed they, that they, this definition alleviated their concern, that they were satisfied with it. I think it's could, important to know. Could I take the remaining minute maybe to ask you just more specifically on the, uh, on the prospect of somebody using the vehicle of journalism and all its salutary aspects to do us harm, to deliberately send from foreign channels or through foreign channels or whatever the case may be, even domestic channels, uh, news that is false. Not to, not to say that this goes into the paradigm of terrorism, but simply mis deliberately mis misleading and false information uh, about international developments, about domestic elements. How does your bill protect against that? And to the extent that we need to ask questions, what kind of questions should be asked? Well, um, I'm not sure the bill would protect against, against this, but I'm not sure the bill has anything to do with that either. You know, one thing is for certain, the bill says that a journalist has to, it has to be its main, his or her main occupation, and it has to be remunerated. So, I mean, someone who's not a real professional journalist will not be protected by, by the bill. Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, if a foreign government, for example, hires a journalist, journalist in, in our sense of the term, to deliberately spread false information, are there any safeguards that we should put in place? Okay, well, what I want to say about that is that, first of all, this bill is to protect the whistleblower, the source, journalist sources, not the journalist itself. We define quite clearly what is a journalist, which is, in some case, is not a real journalist, and also three three points is that at the end of the day it's a superior court judge 
will decide if this guy or this woman is a journalist and if we can anchor him correctly, if not. And let me remind you, all journalists are human beings. They are not away from the bill, from the law. And the law. We shall respect the law in your activities. But first and foremost, we will have to protect the whistleblower. Thanks. We have uh, debate. Uh, Mr. Spengerman. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I've asked this question earlier um, to, to colleagues who were in front of the committee. I'm wondering if you could just describe for the committee and for Canadians how you see the state of journalism today in 2017. We talked a little bit about the pressures, the financial structural changes in terms of employment contracts. Um, some members have, uh, re have re uh, had conversations with stakeholders like Unifor um, who are quite concerned from the financial side about the sustainability of the profession, as independent, as, as um, structured, basically, as a pillar of our democracy. Uh, where do you see that go uh, in the next, let's say, half decade or so? What, what's the current trend? Um, and I see this bill as an element of, uh, of protecting the profession, but there are other components that the committee should be mindful of um, as, we, as we deliberate what we do with this particular instrument. So we're, we're seeing clear fragmentation in, in, in the environment around, around journalism. You have multiple sources of information and you have people choosing to only go to uh, certain sources that sometimes just uh, reaffirm their own uh, a point, point of view. But with the rise of sort of digital and social channels, you have incredible reach. So the ability of a story to have impact and reach more people is, is profound and it's like it, it's like it never has, uh, has been been before. So um, is, is it complicated in terms of the business model? Absolutely. We're seeing that in the private sector, uh, pr particularly with newspapers. In the public sector, we've had our own issues uh, with sort of shrinking budgets and, and trying to do more because you're feeding more digital platforms uh, all, all the time. But I will tell you that uh, all of the research that I've seen, the RTNDA just did a recent study that shows uh, that trust in media, in legacy media, uh, is, is, is actually growing slightly in this in this environment that is cluttered with all kinds of uh, disinformation as, as much as uh, journalism. So I think the promise behind the brand in journalism becomes more uh, important, but the business case is not solved and, and there's no sort of solution on the horizon that, that we can see. Could you elaborate briefly on that study you referred to? Is that based on survey data from uh, basically that reflects the opinion of Canadians? The, R the uh, RTNDA, which is one of the journalism organizations uh, in Canada, did a, a survey about trust in media recently. Um, and one of the findings that they found is uh, trust in mainstream sources of media ha it has increased in this age of uh, fake news, that kind of thing. I I'm happy to get it if, if it's of use. And can you, are you able to comment on the state of the profession in terms of people enrolling in journalism programs and what incentives this bill might provide to to support Canadians in the decision to seek a career in journalism? Uh, I think it's probably un unrelated, but we, we ha have an obligation as journalistic organizations to, to uh, connect uh, not only with schools to, to encourage people to, to uh, you know, consider journalism as a, a profession, but also invest in critical thinking and, and uh, journalism education in terms of how to consume media. And uh, you know, we do that, uh, and we're doing more of it moving forward. Well, just to, uh, you know, related to that, I mean, the, the fact is that the, in this environment of fake news, the only thing we have is our credibility. That is the most precious thing we have and the most fragile. So if you make a mistake, it has even more impact than it may have had before. So, uh, you know, you can be assured and, and, and confident that we, we are so careful when we publish information that is taken from confidential sources that it's been checked two and three times to make sure it is in the public interest and it's accurate. If not, I mean, we, it's, a, it's a huge setback for us. So that's the, that's the commitment we have. And I think it's even more important for us now in this new environment where so many people who actually you know, do whatever they want or you know, produce fake news. Is um, on the subject of fake news, which I think is in the forefront of the minds of many Canadians, um, how are journalists protected against sources that are deliberately created to spread fake news? Well, we never rely on one source. You know, the first rule is minimum two sources and more if it's even more sensitive. I mean, we, we and a source is not just somebody that shows up one day and then you publish the stuff. These confidential sources that we use 
usually we cultivate for weeks and months, sometimes years. So we get to know these people to make sure that they're trustworthy, that what they actually uh, tell us is, is true, is believable. So we have all kinds of safeguards to make sure that you know, we don't fall into that kind of trap. I'll just add to that. Any piece of investigative journalism is built on a mountain of information. That includes documents and, and other kinds of source material in addition to people. Uh, and, you know, with a, a touchy investigation, we do more than double source. We'll have multiple, uh, multiple people around anything that is uh, of that level. I mentioned the RCMP investigation uh, that we did. We had multiple, multiple sources, and, and we test their credibility. So coordinated disinformation campaigns placed against the Canadian journalist who is trained not to a regulatory standard, but to Canadian standards, what we know to be an independent free press, uh, would not be successful in, in your view? Uh, I think, you know, I can only speak for, for the CBC, but we have a, a series of checks and balances, both in terms of our journalistic practices and our, our sort of values around these things. So there are checks and balances all the way through. Yep. That's very helpful. Um, what can you tell the committee about generational divides in terms of how people get their news, what, what their preferences are, what their appetite is for, um, for investigative journalism? So I'm, going to I'm going to surprise the committee to tell you that um, millennials are actually interested in journalism. Uh, CBC News digital, digitally reaches 52% uh, of millennials in this country. Uh, and, uh, you know, they consume it in a different way. They consume it uh, not on television and, and uh, not on radio, but maybe in podcasting and, other, and certainly uh, on, their, on their smartphones. So we, uh, but we see uh, different uh, generations uh, going to different places to consume news. That, that piece is really real. Uh, but we see the younger generation still having an appetite for information and news, uh, and that's heartening. And the, the last question, Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, is, is, is there a gender component in investigative journalism? When we look at specific areas, such as, for example, work in the area of uh, women in the sciences, technology, engineering, and math, if somebody were to write an investigative article on the state of affairs in Canada, are there particular aspects uh, that women journalists would face that require either greater levels of protection or, or would the bill as it's currently framed be satisfactory in terms of the protection of sources um, from a gender perspective? So I will take that as the woman on the panel. Um, um, I, you know, I will say that uh, we have fantastic female investigative journalists, and we, we see no uh, gender imbalance in terms of the nature of who does this work. Uh, but we were uh, concerned with the framing uh, that I referenced in my opening remarks uh, in Quebec around Marie-Maud uh, Denis uh, in terms of uh, implying relationship was part of uh, the, you know, the tools that she used in terms of her journalistic trade. So, um, but in terms of people practicing, uh, we, have, we have quite good gender balance in investigative work. I'll just add that they may feel more vulnerable to sexism and to innuendo. Uh, but at the same time, you know, Marie-Maud Denis and uh, Isabelle Richer, the two women journalists who were caught in this uh, fishing expedition, just want very strong protection for every journalist, regardless of sex. And just if I could to add a, a little bit of extra context in terms of the, um, the state of journalism in this country. Um, first of all, as the panel's resident millennial, I suppose, uh, <laughs> I, I would, I'd like to say that my generation does consume news ravenously. There's more of an appetite out there for news than there ever has been. The problem is that in our country, um, the, the, the news industry has literally been decimated, uh, if, if not more than that. Um, and I mean that in the literal, like a tenth has been destroyed, probably quite a bit more than that. I, I cut my teeth at McLean's Magazine. When I was there, I believe there were 50 people working in the editorial side of the newsroom. Now there are approximately 15. Um, and that's, that's in a matter of 10 years. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a frightening decline that we've seen all across the country. Uh, and whereas in you know, I like to look at it kind of as if the journalism industry in this country was once, you know, a, a, a forest or a jungle that was, and unfortunately, large parts of that have been completely burned to the ground. What that has left is some fertile soil, and there are some new things sprouting up, and there are a lot of uh, organizations that are doing really wonderful things despite these challenges. I think CBC is an excellent example of, of uh, what we've had, but the same thing with the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, the Legacy Media. But the thing is, it is, there is still a massive hole there uh, in this country and people are ravenously devouring content
but there isn't as many people providing good quality content. There's more noise and less signal out there than there has been. And they're also, because sources are drying up, because of we need legislation like this in order to give journalists as much of a fighting chance as they can and to make this uh, pillar of democracy as strong as possible. So taking away those sources by not having a, a shield law is a serious issue. One minute. Very, very, very briefly. Would you, given, given your most recent comments, would you consider us being at a stage where we now have a structural concern with respect to the health of Canadian democracy? Yes, I would, I would certainly say so. I, we funded the News Poverty Project at Ryerson University. I would encourage everyone to take a look at that if you want to see a stark example of how many dozens of newspapers and broadcasters and uh, online outlets have closed and how few have opened across uh, Canada in the, last, in the last five or so years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that has really come to our time for debate, but